Hello, my name is Hein. I am a junior doctor working in NUH. In this video, I'm going to talk about how to approach diagnosis in a patient with palpitation. Palpitation is feeling of awareness of one's own heartbeats. It is a common clinical presentation and it may be quite distressing for patients. It may be due to abnormality in heart rhythm or rate, or sometimes the heart is doing just fine, but you may still be aware of its beating due to a variety of reasons, which we will discuss later in this video. When you're assessing somebody with palpitation, there are three main components. These are checking the background medical history to look for any risk factors or predisposing conditions, assessing the current situation of palpitation, and detecting associated complications. In clinical practice, our first priority is patient safety rather than reaching the diagnosis. So what should happen in first instance is making sure that the patient is stable, and after that, various clinical assessments can follow. So we can start discussing about the causes of palpitation. The easy way to remember them is to categorize them into two groups, one being heart-related and the other being non-cardiac causes. Looking at the cardiac causes, you will see that multiple structural lesions are implicated, which can be detected from thyroid history taking and physical examination. It is important to obtain detailed drug history as well. You should ask about both the prescription and over-the-counter medications because sometimes some unexplained palpitations may be related to medications which we often do not suspect. For example, diet pills containing stimulants. In high upper states and psychiatric conditions, the rhythm that is often associated tends to be relatively benign, such as normal sinus rhythm or sinus tachycardia. Regarding history taking, we can start with our usual approach, which I have outlined in the orange box. In addition to that, I have also listed some points, which I feel can be quite informative. Palpitations in Jenga demographics are often related to abnormalities in conduction pathways. For example, accessory pathway causing pre-excitation syndrome or ventricular tachycardia related to hypertrophic obstructed cardiomyopathy, which has been observed in young athletes. Whereas rhythmia related to acquired structural heart disease can complicate with paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia or atrial fibrillation in elderly population. If you can ask the patient to recall the population episodes and ask them to tap the rhythm out, and if they can do that, that could clue you in for atrial fibrillation, which is irregularly irregular in nature. Patients with premature ventricular or atrial contractions may often talk about feeling of flip-flopping in the chest which they often describe as the heart stopping and then starting again, or as a skid beat with a sensation of a pounding beat. If episodes of palpitations precede presyncope or syncope, you should be aware of sinister causes such as VT. Patients with no SVT are often trained to take control of the situation by performing cassava maneuvers by themselves. Exertion can precipitate some forms of VT, such as those associated with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. Whereas emotional stress has been related to anticholinergic polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. In patients with COPD, a unique rhythm called multifocal atria tachycardia can sometimes be observed, which is actually tachycardia 
with multiple P wave morphologies on ECG. When you examine a patient with palpitation, as I alluded to you earlier in a slide, our first priority is to make sure that the patient is hemodynamically stable. After that, on a general examination, we can look for signs of high output states, such as fever or signs of hyperthyroidism. Cardiovascular examination will be our main focus here, specifically palpating the apical beat, which if displaced may hint at cardiomegaly and actively listening for murmurs and checking JVP to rule out fluid overload. Various pulmonary diseases can complicate with abnormal heart rhythm, so examination of respiratory system is quite important. Among all the investigations that we can do for palpitation, ECG is certainly the most important one. So I'll talk about ECG for the next few slides. Interpretation of ECG can be quite daunting for clinicians, but if there is one thing that I would like you to remember as a take home message, it would be to always compare current ECG with the old one, which would be quite informative in circumstances such as deciding whether the left banner branch block is significant or not, or looking for delta wave in someone suspected of having wolf parkinson white syndrome, which in its arrhythmic state can often be indistinguishable from other arrhythmia, but treatment is different for each condition. So it is important to recognize which one is which. Twelve lead ECG, which we do at bedside, is like a snapshot of cardiac electric activity at that particular point in time. So it may not always reveal underlying abnormal rhythm, especially those that come on periodically. To detect those paroxysmal rhythm, sometimes you may need longer duration of monitoring, which can be accomplished by devices such as 24-hour tape or a vent loop recorder. There are different ways to approach abnormal ECG rhythms in tachycardia. A simple way is to start by establishing that it is a sinus rhythm or not. Normal sinus rhythm means normal P wave followed by normal QRS complex. Check that P waves are present. Do they look normal? Do they share the same form? Or are they displaying multiple morphologies? After analyzing P waves, examine QRS complexes, especially the regularity. A rhythm is said to be regular if the distances between the peaks of R waves are equal throughout the tracing. And then observe how broad QRS complexes are. Normal QRS complexes are measured less than 120 millisecond, and anything broader than that would be defined as broad complex. Narrow QRS complexes are often associated with supraventricular tachycardia, whereas broad QRS complexes are often due to ventricular tachycardia, and very occasionally due to supraventricular tachycardia with better branch block or pre excitation syndrome. I will briefly talk about some classical tachyrhythmia. In atrial fibrillation, there will be no P waves, the rhythm is irregularly irregular, and QRS complexes are narrow unless there is a branch block or if atrial fibrillation originates from accessory pathway. In SVT, P waves are either buried within QRS complexes or they may emerge after QRS complexes, which we often call retrograde P waves. QRS complexes are often narrow unless it is due to pre excitation syndrome or there is coexisting a branch block. If you see regular broad complex tachycardia, it should be regarded as VT until proven otherwise. Both VT and AVRT, which is atrioventricular reentry tachycardia, can present with regular broad complex tachycardia. 
And one way to differentiate between these two is by checking the presence of delta wave in all ECGs, which will point towards AVRT. However, if you're in doubt, please treat it as VT. Sinister body arrhythmia are often caused by heart blocks. Normal PR interval is 120 to 200 millisecond. Prolonged PR interval indicates first degree heart block. If every P wave is not followed by QRS complex, it may be either second or third degree heart block. In third degree or complete heart block, there is absolute association between atrial and ventricular activities. And you will see P waves and QRS complexes appearing at their own intervals on the tracing. You can appreciate banner branch blocks if you see wide abnormal looking QRS complexes, especially in the chest limbs. Position tests that we can do are blood tests such as full blood count, looking for anemia, raised inflammatory markers, electrolytes, especially potassium, calcium, and magnesium, thyroid function test, checking for hyper or hypothyroidism. If you're suspecting structural cardiac lesions, you may need echocardiogram, or in some cases, cardiac MRI. If a patient has accessory pathway-related tachyarrhythmia, they may need electrophysiology study, especially if ablation of the accessory pathway is being considered as a treatment option. In patients with VT and poor left ventricular systolic function, especially if ejection fraction is less than 40%, electrophysiology study can be performed to see if those ventricular tachycardia are inducible. And if they are, the patient may be a candidate for implantable cardioverter defibrillator. Before I conclude, the next few slides will show some notable ECG rhythms with their management. I hope this should help you with assessing patients with palpitation. Please note that this presentation is in no way the exhaustive guideline to approach palpitations, but rather a quick tool that you may use to supplement your own knowledge and clinical practice. And you should always consult with national and local guidelines. And if necessary, you should also involve your cardiology colleagues as well. Thank you for your time.